Good afternoon, everyone, and aloha. Thank you for joining me on Think Tech Hawaii. I am Shonda Park, your host for Money Talk. I am a business owner and investor passionate about helping people understand how money works. Today, I have Brandon Loresco, who is a certified college consultant. Brandon and his team actually helped my family when my daughter Shana was a junior in high school. And with their education and guidance, it helped her to go to Western Oregon University with scholarships and financial aid. Without their guidance, without their education, uh, we probably would not have been able to do that and do that with very little stress. And because of their expertise, um, again, we were able to get my daughter, who was the first in my family, to leave Hawaii and go to college in the mainland. And Brandon has been a certified college consultant for over five years, and he has so much experience in this field, both personally and professionally. So he is here today to share with you very valuable information on financially planning for college that can help families go from zero to millions with financial education. So Brandon, I'm excited to have you here today. Welcome to the show. Awesome, aloha. Thank you, Shonda, for having me on your show. Um, it's great that I could be here to share based on my experience on how college can be affordable um, with looking at, you know, some myth tips and, you know, if, if there's extra time, you know, helping um, those who are already graduated, how we can help them out as well. Awesome. So before we get started with that, please share a little bit more about um, your personal background and how you got started in being a certified college consultant. Right. So, you know, I actually graduated from Campbell High School, class of 2016. And, you know, through that time, um, I was attending some programs to help me with college planning. And I just want to seek other resources. And that's when I came across a program where I am, am now certified. And, you know, through that process, I was able to get accepted to HBU. And in total, from all institutional uh, scholarships and other outside scholarships, I was awarded more than $400,000. And what I used was $100,000, including full tuition to attend Hawaii Pacific University, which I now graduated from past of 2020 with a mark and a finance minor. So today, you know, I am very proud to help families um, look at how they can tackle college planning and career planning. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I could see how this program has helped myself and now be able to help people as a consultant. Yes, and one of those people were my daughter. So thank you so much for that. And being awarded over 400 thousand that is fantastic and you know that's such useful information that so many families need to know because I'm sure not only you but many other people could really use that that kind of help so uh, and like you said you you used over a hundred thousand for Hawaii Pacific University correct right so I was able to use hundred thousand from University of Hawaii I mean no HPU as well as have out extra outside scholarships. But what really happened is that even though I had full tuition to attend that university, I still had to take out some loans. And you know, now I want to share with people, you know, even though having full tuition is great, you know, college can be very expensive because you got to think about, you know, dorming, um, books, technology, and other fees. And you know, I want to be able to be a resource and help people understand that if I can help them be able to get just enough scholarships or even get more financial aid than myself, then, you know, then I'm happier helping them out. Yeah, most people wouldn't think, uh, including myself, that if a person got full tuition, that you would even then still have to take out some student loans. Yes. <laughs> and you did, you did study abroad as well? Correct, yeah. I studied abroad in Korea, studying business at two different universities. And that's why I actually chose Hawaii Pacific University because they could allow me and even use some of the financial aid and scholarships to help take care of those costs. Okay, so two different universities in Korea? Correct, yeah. I went to the countryside. The and the city. North Korea and South Korea? <laughs> <laughs> no, just um, all in South, so countryside. All in South Korea. 
So share a little bit more about that. Not too many Hawaii students study ab abroad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I saw that attending Hawaii, we're in a melting pot of different cultures. And I want to really experience another country, especially an Asian country. And, you know, it's all about what you could get qualified for and what you could test into getting. And Korea had some great universities and they had some awesome programs that gave me a stipend, covered my dorm. So, you know, this has allowed me to not just get an education here, but extend and broaden my horizons in another country. And I loved it so much. After one semester break, um, attending back here, I went back again. Oh, nice. I've never been only to the airport, so I would love to travel there with you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <Fun. laughs> Oh, okay, so tell me about how we can tackle paying off college. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, we could take a look at the first slide. But, you know, if you look at the different costs and way to tackle it, we all understand that college is rising in cost. And we could pay in scholarships, loans, um, work study, grants, and other programs. But really, the, the bigger one that you want to look at is financial aid. Because at the end of the day, you know, one area that we probably don't want to use um, to pay for our costs is probably our out of pocket, you know, our own money. That could be a big headache for some of us. And that's why I want to shed light and looking at how um, there's different types of financial aid, one being financial need based and the second being merit based. And today we will highlight and look over how financial need based and how we could qualify for that. Okay, great. Thank you. And according to a new National College Attainment Network analysis, it shows statistics show that the high school class of 2021 left an estimated 3.75 billion in Pell Grants on the table by not completing the free application for federal student aid. That's crazy. So, uh, and, you know, how would this affect families today? Right. It's crazy to see that there's unclaimed um, grants and, you know, just aid that's available. And if we were to look at the average student, you know, they could receive in Pell Grant about 4500 So what does that billion dollars make up? You know, of, there could be about um, 800,000 families and students who could have gotten this aid. And, you know, just doing this um, um, free application for first one aid, you know, this allows you to be eligible for it but many families may have not submitted an application simply because of, you know, not believing um, in it and not having enough information and maybe just having some misconceptions that had, you know, led them to not fill it out. About 800,000 families. That's so many families that were left behind not applying, you know, to get this grant. So. Explain how does a family become eligible for this financial aid? Right. So, you know, when they, um, we see that over time, there's a lot of, um, you know, decreasing number of students applying for FAFSA. And if you know FAFSA, you know, in this next slide, we will see that when we fill out this application, it's all about, you know, well, what are we going to get in financial needs? So we have the cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution equals financial needs. So what we learn over here is that, of course, you know, you're looking at colleges and you're going to see the, the cost of attending it from tuition, um, dorming, meals, books, other such. And then the expected family contribution or the EFC, this is where the FAFSA comes into play, the, where you are able to input your income, your assets as a student and parent, and it will determine how much you are expected to put into school leaving you with just this financial need. And this financial need will give you a student aid report, award letter telling you what kind of um, loans, grants, scholarships you could get from the federal, state side, institutional, and other programs. So, you know, there's a lot of um, opportunity there just, you know, filling out this um, FAFSA application alone. It sounds pretty simple. So will you share some of the reasons why families don't submit this application? Right. So, you know, there are some three myths I want to go over. And the first myth um, in the next slide will be myth number one, my family makes too much money. You know, simply we may think that, hey, if my parents or myself all together, we make about $75,000 or $100,000, we may not be eligible. But in the end, 
you know, there is no income limit that will um, set you apart for submitting this application. So, you know, I want to encourage families that regardless of what um, income you make, you know, just just submit an application because there's other factors that come into play to being eligible for financial aid. But I can see how families would think that they make too much because usually there is an income cap. So you're saying no matter what your income is um, for the student themselves and for their parents, no matter what their income, every single family that's applying for college should also fill out and submit this FAFSA application? Yes, correct. And this kind of leads into the next myth. So myth number two, we see that, you know, we believe that once I completed my FAFSA application and, you know, in my senior year, I probably don't have to do it again. But really, you have to do this for every year um, for the next academic year you're going to attend college. So, you know, at the end of the day, you're probably going to fill this out four times while you're attending college. Um, every October 1st, they have that new application open. And that's when you can submit it as soon as possible because, you know, the sooner you can get it, you know, you could be um, getting some financial aid that's on a first come first serve basis. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, so uh, some families think that you only have to fill it out once. So that's another reason why money is just left on the table because once they do it, they don't realize that you have to keep submitting it year after year but then you can continue getting um, getting awards every single year that you apply. Right, and that's correct. And, you know, I want to cover the last myth that we have. So myth number three, you know, we see that um, people submit FAFSA only to schools you are accepted to. So in the application, they're going to ask you, you know, what 10 schools you want to get connected to. And, you know, I say, you know, put as much as options as possible. If you have any interest in this school or university, you know, put them on the application. Um, there is no penalty for not putting them. And really, you know, when we see this, um, you know, you, this is October 1st. You're submitting your application in October for a FAFSA, but you probably haven't been accepted to any colleges yet, right? Because that admission is going to be in January, February, and you're not going to get your award letter till later. So I say, hey, if you have a strong interest in a school, put them on there. You don't know what kind of aid you could, um, you could get from them. And, you know, if you have a strong desire for a certain school, especially a school that you're going to attend to in your state of residence, put them on the top of the list because there is like a order of, um, you know, what kind of aid you can get and the priority. Okay, so uh, it's okay for uh, seniors in high school to just go ahead and list their top 10 schools because at this point they're still not 100% certain where they're going, they can list 10 schools. Right. So, you know, I, of course, this can give you time to, you know, um, appraise each option that comes from each school and then attend, you know, different um, college fairs and, and attend different college tours so you could make a better decision, um, you know, at the end of your senior year. Okay, awesome. That's really good to know that they can, they don't have to feel the stress of narrowing it down to just one school or maybe their top three. They can just go ahead and just think of any college that, you know, popped in their head that they're considering, even if it's 10 schools, and make sure that they fill out their application starting October 1st. So I'm sure if people already, you know, were educated about the FAFSA, as soon as October 1st came around, you filled it out. However, for some of the viewers here, if this is the first time that you're receiving this information, it's so uh, still early. You have the rest of the month to apply. Just don't wait. Just get on this right away because Brandon, is it uh, first come first serve basis? Yes, for this first, come first serve basis. And you know you do have some time to fill it out till um a couple months or so after. But you know the sooner the better. Okay, the sooner the better. So mark your calendar that every single October first that you should be applying for the FAFSA because like Brandon said, it's something that you have to do every year. And can you imagine for some people who go to school more than four years and you know we have some right um, lifetime students, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder if there's a limit on <laughs> how many years you can apply for the FAFSA if you can apply <laughs> year after year. You can keep applying every year. 
Um, I mean, there's also for those who are going through undergrad and their graduate years, but, you know, just make sure that you stay up to date. You sign up for like um, subscriptions to get updated by the student aid because, you know, it was, um, it wasn't always October 1st was the opening, but right now it is every October 1st, the FAFSA will be open. But I think, you know, that is um, just a great way for you to be reminded and stay up to date. Yes, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing the myth about uh, why families are not filling out this FAFSA application. So now do you have some tips for families? Yes, I have two tips right now. So um, the first tip being is look, um, begin financial planning sooner. Because as you see on the screen, there is, um, these are some screenshots from a portion of the FAFSA form today. So for example, you are a senior and you want to go to college next academic year, 2023 to 2024. But what they're going to use is to see if you have filled out your 2021 federal tax return. So parents and students, you know, you're going to connect that and put that information on your FAFSA. And this will help determine, you know, that financial need that you're eligible for. So, you know, what can we look at this? Oh, it's another perspective that if you are a um, if you have or you are a high school sophomore or junior, this is the most critical time to start um, looking at financial planning for the parents and the student so that you can be prepared for that upcoming FAFSA application. Now, this doesn't, you know, set apart those who are already in college or who are senior today. You guys can start um, working with a financial professional or your tax preparer, but, you know, whatever information that you put in, um, today and, and what you do for your taxes will kind of affect more so your following years applying for FAFSA. Okay, thank you for that information. Anything else that you can share about that? Because I know when it comes to especially taxes and tax returns and all of these uh, financial planning, it can be very confusing, burdensome for families. And a lot of times uh, people don't want to even look at it. So how can families simplify it the most for themselves? You know, I would say, you know, just just work with someone you trust and uh, someone who's experienced. But, you know, this kind of leads to the next tip. Uh, and, you know, just tip number two would be um, you are you can be able to write a financial aid appeal letter. So, you know, I want to ask you, Shonda, did you know that when you get an award letter, from a school telling you that this is the aid that you're eligible for, that you can actually negotiate with them? I had no idea. Because who would even guess that when you are awarded financial aid, I mean, it's already free money. So who would think that you could negotiate the free money that you're getting awarded? Mm -hmm. Right, and that's crazy. So it's all yeah. about the appeal letter. You know, we say that the, the FAFSA applications based on that 2021 tax returns, for example, but we can all agree that things can change anytime from that 2021 till today and when you're going to attend school. Because um, don't you agree that within the last um, few years with the pandemic, we have seen such huge economic changes, especially in our homes? Yes, I completely agree. Right. So that FAFSA application is only, you know, a portion of you know, understanding your situation for colleges. Now you can work with someone you trust. You know, there are financial aid departments and, you know, they are there for you to work with maybe a counselor there and, and find someone who's experienced, whether it's outside or there to help you write a letter to say, hey, you know, I have um, this much financial need, um, but, you know, I see that I'm not getting, you know, the award package that kind of meets that. What can we do to work it out? Um, but, you know, really, if we think about the changes over time, many people can get laid off. There could be a reduction in income. Um, we live in a day and age of mixed families, so people who have um, parents who they stay with at certain times. And all of these are factors that you could address in that appeal letter. So, you know, again, find someone who you can trust, um, who could help you um, raise your chances of um, making that negotiation in a way. But, you know, just try it out. Simply ask and, you know, try submit a financial aid appeal letter. That's right. Because if you don't ask, you never know. 
and anything can happen at any time and people's situations change drastically right and it's it, it's inevitable that changes will happen whether it's positive or negative and it's good to know that if someone is awarded for example five thousand dollars and now something drastic has happened that their needs has significantly changed and maybe their needs are double the amount maybe their needs are ten thousand it's mm -hmm. really wonderful to know that there is a process that they can actually write a appeals letter to be able to get what their need is now and not what it was when they applied right because you know even for myself um i have seen that i had to um, go to a point of asking and doing a financial aid appeal letter so in my about my third year in college um i saw that there are some changes in my package that you know i was awarded something but i wasn't able to fully utilize it in the academic year so i asked and worked it out on you know what can we do you know would it be work study could it be you know changes between a, a subsidized and unsubsidized loan so you know it's all about working it out and just simply asking yes just simply asking that's all you have to do again if you don't ask you never know so here's another area that you can ask and here's something else that i did not know and I got this information from Brandon as well. And I know all the viewers are going to love this information too. Uh, what can people do who have already graduated from college and they still have outstanding student loans? Right. So that's a great question. You know, so for those viewers who are um, already graduated from college, uh, maybe have some student loans, be aware that, yes, there are some like forgiveness, debt forgiveness plans out there. But um, you probably have heard of the Biden administration and their plan to forgive loans. So two things I want to address with this Biden plan. You know, the first thing is they want to forgive up to $20,000 of student loans. Um, and all of this will be determined by an application. So you not everyone's going to automatically be eligible and you're not going to see this magically disappear from your account. But you have to submit an application. And um, maybe with due to some income and other factors, you could get $10,000 paid off. And if you're eligible for a Pell Grant, you could get around $20,000 paid off in student loan. So um, again, the application are open the same time as the FAFSA. So October 1st, um, find someone, you know, I could maybe help you guys get directed to that website and you guys can fill out the application. And it, I would say the deadline, um, I believe it might be the end of this month. Um, so at least just submit it as soon as possible. But the second tip I want to lead into is, um, you know, we have those who have already paid off their loans or started making payments to that, right? So we know that there's from forbearance that they delay the interest bearing on our loans. Mm -hmm. But some of us, we probably had already made some payments. So if you had made payments, I believe it's March, so March 13, 2020. If you made any payments on or after that, you know, you could be eligible for a refund. So, you know, there is some example of those who um, probably want to pay off their loans because there's no interest. Uh, maybe they just made more money in the past couple of years and they want to get rid of their debt. But now they are um, looking into the idea of refunding. So um, the best thing to do is to stay updated on, you know, what they, um, what they can address. Um, things can change. So go on the student aid website, and be able to to read upon you know the most recent details of what you can qualify for. Okay, great. Um, this is really fantastic information because my daughter Shana had paid off all her student loan debt in full, and I believe it was this year. So you said anytime after March 13, 2020, anytime on March 13, 2020, and after. Yep, March 13, 2020, and then until right now. Okay, so she is eligible. I'm going to make sure that she watches this episode. And also, I'm going to have her contact you so that uh, she can have your assistance. And it's possible that she may be eligible to getting a refund of $20,000. Um, so I, I'm not too sure what would be the, in, the limits of what you could get as a refund. Mm -hmm. But uh, 20000 is separate of loan forgiveness for those okay. who have a loan currently. And then the refund is a separate thing. Is there any last minute 
tips or myths that you would like to share with the viewers today, Brandon? Oh, no. Mahalo. Thank you for letting me come into today's show and to talk about financial aid. Um, again, I just want to reemphasize that college can be affordable. You know, every college is built differently. And we may not know that attending the, the least expensive school may not be the most cost efficient for yourself. So, you know, do not limit yourself to the opportunities that are available out there. Um, be able to look into different options. And, you know, I hope that I could expand more another time on the different ways that we could tackle financial aid. Since you brought that up, I want to touch on this last subject. A lot of times people look at cost first when they're looking at college, but that is not the correct order that you should be looking at, right? Correct. It would be, you know, cementing your career ideas first, what you want to do, then looking at the college that can provide the best programs, and then look at the cost of that. So the cost should be the last thing you should really be worried about, and that's how we should plan for our college. Great. Great information. Career first, then the college, and then the cost. Don't think of the cost first. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's so much information, as you can see, regarding college planning. So Brandon has agreed to be on the next episode of Money Talk. Until then, feel free to reach out to him with any questions that you may have. And we will see you on the next episode of Money Talk. Thank you for joining us. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.